So we're looking at Luke 14, which has a lot to do with hospitality and eating meals together. And I wanted us each to take a moment and think about the last people that we had a meal with. So can you recall to mind the last people that you either hosted a meal uh, at your house, maybe you went to their home, maybe if you weren't hosting it, you went to a restaurant uh, and you ate together. So do you have them in your mind? Okay, now I want you to, to think about those people and ask some questions. Are they like you or are they different than you? Are they really similar? Do they share like the same education level? Uh, would they have gone to similar schools as you? Would they earn about the same amount of income, your, kind of the household income? Is it similar to, to your income? How about their kids? Do their kids go to the same school as you? When they go on vacation, do they go to the same types of places that you would go on vacation? Are, are they more similar or are they different than you? Do they look like you? Uh, do, they, do they share a similar ethnicity or, or background? Are they from the same or a different socioeconomic background? So now, this passage is meant to challenge us. Are the people that we spend our time with the ones that look like us and talk like us? And are they the kind of people that Jesus, in our passage, and as we go through the Gospel of Luke, would spend time himself with? Would Jesus eat and drink with the kind of people that, that we associate with. Well, I want to be back up a little bit to the beginning of Luke and just remember a little bit of a review here who Jesus came for. So if we go to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, we see kind of the purpose statement of Jesus's ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So who do we see Jesus coming for? The poor, the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed. Now these could certainly be spiritual realities, poor in spirit. We talk about that in the scriptures, spiritually blind. But I don't think we want to be too quick to allegorize these, to make them into metaphors. I think these are the kinds of people Jesus was talking about, the people that are on the, the fringes of society. And so it makes sense as we go through the Gospel of Luke that Jesus actually ate and drank with these kinds of people, that he spent time over meals with them. Luke chapter 5, verses 29 through 32, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now these next two verses are a foundation verse that we recently wrapped up memorizing. So I thought we could all say it together as a group. So would you say with me, just starting in verse 31, ready? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I think that was the one that I tried to do from memory and just completely botched last time. So I was happy to put it on the screen this time around. Now, when we come to our passage, what do we find? Do we continue to see Jesus prioritizing these kinds of people, tax collectors, sinners, the unclean in that society, they were often considered unclean, like they're, they're, they're ritually, spiritually, and holy, so we can't spend time with tax collectors, with sinners. We can't be around them. And who do we see Jesus spending time with then in Luke chapter 14? Well, we see him eating with the unexpected. I want you to look down at, at verse 1. It says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. So where is he eating? He's eating in the house of a, of a Pharisee. These are the, 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 the elite. These are the ones who, uh, according to tradition, if you were to come and eat in their home, they might make you wear a garment just to make sure that you didn't get them spiritually unclean. So they certainly weren't fan of 
fans of spending time with people that were sinners and tax collectors, your, your sin might rub off on me. I certainly don't like that. And that's kind of what we get in this picture. Now, Jesus didn't go because he suddenly began to prefer eating and drinking and talking with the rich and with the Pharisees. He went because he had to teach them something. (laughs) See, there was a man there. He had a a normal swelling. Maybe there was some fluid in his body that had built up. The Pharisees, the people, they're watching Jesus to see, what's the Sabbath? Are you going to heal on the Sabbath? Working, uh, healing someone, that's work. You can't work on the Sabbath according to our tradition. What does Jesus do? He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to do good? You have an ox or a child, like you'll pull them out of a hole. You'll pull them out of a pit. Is it not good to, to heal this man? And then he heals this man. And he doesn't stop there because we know Jesus and he, he keeps on going. Starting in verse 7, he sees the people that are at this dinner party. and They're kind of milling about, jockeying for the highest place of honor. Now, I thought this was kind of an interesting excerpt, so I I wanted to share with you a quote from a, a, a cultural backgrounds commentary that explains this a little bit more. It says, meals were important social rituals in the ancient world, and one would normally eat only with those of his or her own social class. One's place at the table was determined by social status, and the places beside the host represented the highest status. Now, this shouldn't be that surprising, right? Because we're similar, aren't we? Like when we want to spend time with our friends or we go out to dinner, we want to make sure that we sit near them. And you might like try to center yourself right in the center or, or have your friends sit close to you. And if there are people there that you don't really like, you might kind of send them off to another table or some other location. And so it was no different. But when Jesus sees them... He says, this is wrong. See, if you seek the place of highest honor, and you sit down there, and someone else walks in who is actually more honorable, that is in a higher social class than you, your host is going to say, hey, would you move? (laughs) You're going to have to go sit in the lowest seat, and it's going to be incredibly shameful for you. It's going to be incredibly dishonoring. So seek the lowest position. So that your host can come to you and say, hey, why don't you come sit in this more honorable position? That's, that's the honorable thing to do. Because those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, Jesus is laying a framework right here for hospitality. He's laying a framework for, for meals, for eating together, for fellowshipping. To not choose to, to affiliate with the best, and the brightest, but to, to go and to climb down the social ladder. We are not a church that is all about like, giving you hints and tricks for how you can become like, the most successful, uh, popular, rich person. My advice tonight is to climb down the social ladder. Don't try to spend time with those that are, that are socially higher than you. Let's climb down this ladder together because eating and drinking together can be a powerful ministry. Jesus eats with the unexpected. In verse 12, he does, Jesus, I think, would actually I don't know if I would want to have Jesus over to my house for dinner. I don't know if you have any of, like, who's your guest that you would like to have come to dinner, and you're, like, imagining the, the, the most famous people you can think of and someone who is a Christian's like, I would like to have Jesus at dinner. And everyone's like, oh, I should have thought of that. That would have made me look more holy than everyone else. I don't know if that's actually a good idea because when Jesus comes to dinner, he starts to teach the host. He, he calls out the one who's in charge. He says, when you give a a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your relatives, your your brothers, your sisters, your rich neighbors. Don't use this as an opportunity to climb up. Use it as an opportunity to climb down. Give a banquet. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, 
and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus has an eternal reward in mind. And so he challenges us to get outside of our comfort zones and eat and drink and spend time talking with those that don't normally look like us. And I'm not here to shame you at all for eating and drinking with people that are like you. I just did this yesterday. But this is to make us pause and to think, God, are, are we also eating with the unexpected? Monica and I have tried to put this into practice in our lives, and I certainly don't elevate us as this, uh, this shining example, but when we lived in uh, some apartments in Lowell, apartments are a great place to meet new people and to kind of reach, a, reach across social and economic and ethnic uh, boundaries that you would normally run into. Uh, but we had lots of different neighbors, uh, and Monica would joke that whenever the fire alarm went off in our building, I would always get really excited and run outside so I could meet all of our neighbors, and that's actually true. Uh, I would get excited because I could meet all of our neighbors. Uh, and one day I met uh, an Indian family, and we invited them over for dinner and have gotten to know them. We've been to their house, and they've been to ours. It's been a little bit but that first time when he came over, he told us, like, we've never been invited into, like, an American house before. Like, this is the first time kind of being in the house of someone from, like, this culture. We live in Westford or in this region, and there are a lot of people from India. And we can't assume that just because there are many of them that they feel welcomed or integrated in our culture and in our society. We can't assume that they feel loved here. And spending time over meals and hospitality, inviting them into our homes is a way that we can model the love of Christ. In a way that we can do what Jesus says to do. To reach across boundaries that normally would be very challenging. To trust that God's going to do something. Jesus eats with the unexpected and he calls us to do it as well. So that's looking at the first 14 verses, but we're going to begin to go through verses 15 through 24, just a little bit uh, slower. So I want, uh, Jesus tells another parable. And the point that I want to draw from this is that Jesus invites us to a great banquet. So this is why we also go out and invite the unexpected, because Jesus invites us, and, and we're the unexpected. Just like verses 15 and 16 say, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus. So here's someone who's, who heard Jesus' awkward comments and just tries to make it better. Like there's someone in, in, there's one of these people in every group. He says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus has this great opportunity to be real positive and encouraging, <laughs> And we're going to see that he uses it as another teaching opportunity. Jesus invites us to a great banquet. Now, it's in, in that culture, and I think we can see some of these images in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, people believed that, the Jewish people believed that at the end of time, God would host this great banquet for his people. That kind of heaven, eternity was was is pictured as this wonderful feast. And so there, here we see this man reflecting that, that belief. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. The problem is, and we're about to find this out a little bit more, we talked about this last week, is that the Jewish people, this nation, they're largely rejecting the one who is the host. They're rejecting the Lord of the feast. They're rejecting the one who has the house and the food and who prepares the meal. They're rejecting Jesus. See, they like Jesus' his popularity, his power, maybe even some of his miracles, but they don't like that he doesn't submit himself to them and that he seems to be teaching these teachings that, that are contrary to what they prefer. See, they don't want to associate with the unclean. They don't want to associate with the poor and the lame and the unexpected. And Jesus is all about these kinds of people. 
And so they reject him. Jesus invites us to a great banquet. Do we reject him? Every week, we want to wrestle with this question. Am I accepting the invitation to the great banquet? Or am I turning it away? We're about to read a little bit here of three men who turn away. And it's my prayer that this will be none of us tonight, that none of us will turn Jesus' invitation away. Verse 16, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Many make excuses and have other priorities. Many make excuses and have other priorities. This is what we see. A certain man, that's Jesus. He's the host. He's going out. He's going through Israel. He's going through the nation. And he's inviting people into the kingdom of God. He's inviting people to this great banquet, but it's through him. It's through repenting of sin and turning to Jesus Christ in faith. And he sends out invites. People make excuses. They have other priorities, other things to do. Now, in that culture, I mean, if you're going to make a banquet, it's going to be a significant time. The refrigeration wasn't very good in that time period. So if you're going to have a, a, a feast with meat, like this is going to be fresh meat. You're going to try to eat as much of it as you can. People didn't have like their daily allotment of meat to eat. You're going to try to get it all in. It's going to be costly. It's going to be expensive to to host a banquet. And do you notice from the text that these are people that have already accepted the invitation? Tell to those who have been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Verse 17. In other words, These people had already put it on their calendar. I'm going to be there. And now they're saying, I'm not going to be there. Maybe some of you have gotten married or been through the wedding process. What are the first things you do? You get married, you send a save the date card. This cute little card, you put a lot of thought and design into it, and you mail it out. Unless you're me, I sent an email. (laughs) Save the date through email. It seemed to work. And then once people kind of have that, a couple months later, as the wedding gets closer, you send an RSVP card. And this was much cuter in our family because Monica was over uh, those cards. And what do you do on the, on the card? You, you check off, yes, I would like chicken or like the vegetarian or, or whatever. You check out off and then you say, who's coming? So is your spouse coming, significant other, your, your children coming? You write it down, and then you send it back. And then the, the bride and the groom, well, they, they plan uh, the party based on that information. In many weddings, what do you have to do? You have to pay per plate. <laughs> you have to pay for each individual person. Today, I looked up the average cost of a wedding in the U.S., and I think it was 2017. It was $34,229. $34,229. Wow. <laughs> that's the average cost. That means that's what most people spend on weddings. And I don't know about you, but at our wedding, we had, we had a guy that we saw the day before, and he's like, yeah, I'll be there. I'll see you tomorrow. And then he didn't show. <laughs> And it stung, right? Because it was costly. And I know that if you've had a wedding, you know that people RSVP and then they don't come. And you're like, what's wrong with you? And if, and if that was you, you can come and repent to me tonight and I will, I will accept your repentance. It will bring me personal healing. And it's costly and it's like this, this slap. 
Now, what if you had someone who you're like, okay, I'll see you tomorrow, and they're like, actually, I won't see you tomorrow because I have to sit on my couch and watch Netflix. <laughs> You'd be like, what? What? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. We have this awesome party. There's going to be dancing. Come on out. Well, that's kind of what these guys do, these three guys. They begin to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, they didn't have Google Earth back then, right? So you would expect that they would have inspected the field before they bought it. This man, this, he would have gone to that field many times. He would have known that field because he was going to do something with that field. He wanted to know how much work he was going to have to put into that field. So I guess this is, I don't, I don't know what this is, a post-sale inspection? It doesn't make sense. It's not a good excuse. See, our excuses often sound good in our minds. God, I don't have time for you. I don't have time because I'm busy, because I have to get to work, or I'm tired, I'm not going to go to church, or, or I don't have time to spend in your word, or in prayer, or with brothers and sisters in Christ, because I'm just so busy, and those excuses sound so good in our minds, but when we bring them before the reality of, of what it costs, not being able to spend time with the Lord, and we realize those aren't good excuses. Those aren't good priorities. The second man is pretty much the same. I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I gotta go try them out. So that's 10 cows. I gotta go try these, these cattle out. Now, I'm assuming that if you can test drive a car before you buy it, you can probably test drive a cow before you buy it. Please excuse me. I love the third guy. He doesn't even ask to be excused. He just says, still another said, I just got married so I can't come. You'll learn that once you get married, you can often blame your wife for whatever you want. This man has that down. I just got married, so I can't come. It's not, it doesn't even say, like, I just had my wedding. And clearly, like, he already accepted. It doesn't conflict with anything. He just doesn't want to be there. See, this reflects the hearts of the people. Yeah, at first they're interested in Jesus. Jesus is doing miracles. Jesus is powerful. Jesus makes us feel good. But at the end of the day, I don't really want to submit myself to his teachings. I don't want to bend my knee to him. I don't want to obey his teachings. I just want his miracles. I just want his power. I don't want his rule in my life. That's what we see here in this passage. These people aren't interested in Jesus for who Jesus presents himself to be. And it's a tragedy. How many of us, like, we, we come, we get interested, we're like, oh, yeah, this Jesus, like, I like the songs, I, I feel good. Maybe you even say, like, the sinner's prayer, the prayer of conversion. That's kind of like your RSVP card. Yes, God, I will be at the great banquet. I'm going to send that out. I checked yes. But then as time goes on, you separate yourself from a Christian community. You separate yourself from the church. And you notice that in your own heart, it just becomes easier to ignore Christ. Like, he, he's, like if there's this, this orbit, like, like Jesus is just getting further and further away. And he has less and less gravity in your life. Less and less presence to move you. Many make excuses and have other priorities. May that not be us. May we be convicted. May we be challenged. But Jesus invites the social outcast and the foreigner. So we see as he goes on, verse 21 through 24, the servant came back and reported to his master that the owner of the house became angry <laughs> and ordered his servant Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. See, what we see Jesus doing here is in inviting the social outcasts. I want to define the social outcasts as the people within the Jewish community, the people in that town. Go to the alleys, go to the streets. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. The people that you know 
that are within this community that other people don't want to associate with, that other people look down upon, that other people don't want in their lives. Go to them and invite them into my house. The poor, the oppressed, the broken. These are the kinds of people that Jesus is just so interested in. Jesus has a heart for them. And we as his servants are called to have a heart for them as well. And we often do this through the the ministry of meals. I wanted to share some different ways that like Monica and I have tried to put this into practice, but then also I, I, I think uh, we have opportunities as a church body to be doing this. There are lots of different categories of people in our own life that you know, we wouldn't normally associate with. And I think that's different for each of us, right? Because some of us may feel really comfortable with one group that other people say, I don't feel as comfortable with them. What's your group? Who are those people that are so different from you? That you're like, I don't really want to go near them. Or I know them. And they're with, in my community. Like in my town, there was a man who would always go to the post office and he'd walk around town and he'd go in stores and visit people. And he was really nice. He just never washed his clothes. He just smelled really bad. People didn't want to spend time with him. People didn't want to talk with him. Maybe it's the neighbor who, if you get caught in a conversation, you'll be there for like a solid hour. And you're like, I got to stay away from that neighbor. Maybe it's the, the classmate who identifies as transgender. And how you just like don't know what to do with that because it's so different. Maybe it's the parents of a child that your, friend is, your, your child is friends with in school and your, their parents are gay. You're like, what do I do with that? How do I relate to them? What's the, the group of, of people that you have a hard time reaching out to? Jesus calls us to invite those people to his banquet, the social outcasts. Back when Monica and I were in the apartment, we felt convicted. I don't know why the Lord brought this into our heart, but we felt convicted that we weren't very good at reaching out to gay people. So we prayed. Monica prayed one evening that the Lord would just bring more gay people into our life. Uh, not, not, not meant to be like a project, but just to, to love them and to reach out to them and pray for them. And it was like literally the next night we had a knock on the door and we got to be in a relationship with this girl and we got to know her. And over the course of time, it didn't take very long to find this out, but she said that she was really a man on the inside and that she was going to get changed to line up with her true gender. And that was very challenging Especially when she said, please call me by this other name. Refer to me as a man. I used the male pronoun. And wrestling with, like, okay, I, I call you he, she. Like, what do I do? And we got to know him over the course of 18 months. Got to share Jesus Christ with him. And... And as he was going towards the actual surgery, I said, like, don't do it. I had a hard conversation, and we lost the friendship. That friendship is completely gone. Jesus doesn't say, like, if you eat and drink and spend time with people who are different than you, that it's going to go well. He just says to do it, to invite, to spend time because we can't assume that other people are doing it. I, I, I remember talking, so I don't know if you're familiar with Bill Henson. Uh, he does this ministry called Lead Them Home Ministries. It's to the LGBTQ community. And he said, Massachusetts is a state that will often be very progressive in the ways that it votes. It, it, it votes very progressive in this issue, but when it comes to actual relationships, 
the people in LGBT communities don't feel accepted. They don't get invited over to people's houses. They don't have as many friendships. So you can vote one way, but then do the exact opposite with your actions. Why don't we as Christians say, I'm just going to follow the way of Christ, and it's going to be messy. It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to try to love and be kind to people in this area that are different than me. In the fall, I'm going to lead through a two five-week series. We have to figure out when, but it's, a, it, it's talking about this issue. It's about speaking grace and truth to LGBTQ people and building relationships. It's a video series, and we'll have some discussions. So if you want to wrestle with this issue with me, because I'm learning too. Obviously, I am not a master. I don't claim to be. Come take that. That'll be in September. I would love to go through that with you. Jesus invites the social outcasts, and he uses the ministry of meals. Next week, uh, Mark's going to give a a quick ministry moment on the Safe Families ministry. I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder. I'm just going to give you like a a layup, and you can kind of hit it out of the park next week. Safe, uh, safe, uh, did I use the wrong terms? Like (laughs) underhand pitch. Sorry, I'll repent later. Uh, uh, Safe Families is a ministry to, um, to families that need help in times of emergency, in times of brokenness. And they are usually poor or uh, needing help, like single incomes, uh, single moms. They need someone to watch their kids for a, a week or two as they have like a medical procedure or something that they're going through. And it's a wonderful opportunity to spend time with people that are within our community but are in need. And you don't have to be the one to actually host the kids in your family, uh, in, in your home. You can be a, a support person or you can get supplies. And so I hope that you'll pay attention next week because that's going to be a, a meeting we're going to have in August. It's going to be after church, August 18th, I think. And I hope that you'll prioritize uh, being there because it's a way that we can be loving the outcasts. And how about the foreigners? Let's keep looking at these last two verses. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So who are these people in the country roads and the the highways and byways? They're the people outside the community. These are the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And Jesus said, I I is saying, I'm bringing the gospel to them. Now, as we apply that to us, who are these people? Well, it's it's the foreigner, it's the people that the immigrant, the alien, the people that aren't used to, to being in America, who don't speak English as their primary language. How can we be loving and caring for them as followers of Christ Jesus? I don't think this is a partisan issue. This is a gospel issue. This is a Christian issue. We are called to love and care for the immigrant. One of the ways that we have tried to do this in my family is uh, when kind of the environment first got a little hostile to immigrants. And I think it is a hostile environment right now. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. I sent an email to my friend from the apartment days, my Indian friend, and just said, I'm glad you're here. Like, I like your presence. We appreciate you. Trying to, to, to exude the love of Christ to the foreigner, to the alien, to the immigrant. And as I think about these things, Jesus invites the social outcasts and the foreigners, and I look at your faces, I see so many people who are already doing this. I see so many people who have already put this into practice in their own lives, and I want to encourage you, amen, praise God. Keep doing it. And for those of us that are not doing this, let us be challenged, let us be convicted. I want to just focus briefly on the last verse. We're wrapping up. It says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus is shocking his audience. I don't think this means that no Jewish people will be saved. Paul writes in Romans 11, something's going to happen. God's going to do a work in the people of Israel. I think he's going to bring many, many Jewish people to Christ. So don't lose hope. 
And if you're someone who has gone through your life rejecting Jesus, if we can't lose hope for them, there's, there's hope for you. Uh, here's my, my big idea as we close. The banquet is served, you're invited, bring an outcast. The banquet is served, you're invited, bring an outcast. I want to focus briefly on the gospel as we close. So the gospel is the good news that, that Jesus was like in, in perfect harmony. The Son of God was enjoying, enjoying perfection, and he stepped down out of that to, to walk in the alleyways, to walk among the poor and the crippled, to walk among us, sin-stained people, so that he could love us, so that he could bring us home. In fact, Jesus became a foreigner. <laughs> he became a foreigner in this world. He became a cripple. Jesus became a cripple as nails were driven through his wrists and feet. He became that so that we could be healed, so that we could go. And Revelation talks about this great wedding feast so that we could spend all eternity praising God and enjoying each other and enjoying God. To get there, what do we do? We repent, we put our faith, we follow Christ. The banquet is served, you're invited, bring an outcast. Let me pray. Thank you for inviting us to the great banquet, Father. Thank you for sending your son to pay the penalty for our sins to make this possible. Help us to invite others and help us to appreciate what you have given us. You've given us so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.